Welcome everybody back. Appreciate everybody being here this afternoon. This morning we discussed believing faith versus saving faith. And the importance of being able to explain to those around us, especially those who have uh, religious persuasion, religious uh, affiliation with churches or with, uh, as it may be, different community uh, churches, faiths that don't believe in First of all, baptism necessarily for remission of sins, but, but more than that, those who believe simply that as long as you have faith, you'll be saved. And we discussed the differences of examples that we have of individuals who had a believing faith, but it didn't prompt them to act. And we compared them to examples of people who it did spur them to action and cause them to obey what God has told them to do. And in the process of our discussion this morning, we noted how James makes the statement that faith without works is dead. However, on the flip side, if you discuss this with someone, they may try to argue that by putting the responsibility on us to act, that we are in some way trying to earn our salvation. So this is the follow-up argument from those who believe in, quote-unquote, faith only, which is belief only, that you don't have to obey, that you don't have to do stuff, and then any time that the suggestion is there that you must obey, that you must, there's actually things you must do in order to obtain salvation and to maintain salvation, then the counter-argument becomes, well, you're just saying that you have to earn your way to heaven. That by doing things, you're taking away from the grace of God. And as such, instead of God's grace, it's God owes. And that argument is based upon the idea of works. And what we do, whether it's the works unto salvation, which include confession, repentance, and baptism... Or it includes works with regard to the walk of the Christian, whether that is to abstain from sin, as there are those who believe that it doesn't matter once you're saved, whatever that may be, belief only, uh, that you're always saved and you can't fall from that, and it doesn't matter what you do. It may be the way in which we worship. It may be the way in which the church is, is set up and organized. Any aspect of things that we submit to the commandments of can be argued as being earning salvation and therefore rejected in totality because if you're obeying or submitting to some commandment, that means that you're trying to earn salvation. And so for a few minutes this afternoon, I'd like to consider with you whether or not in a, attached to the saving faith, if that automatically means that I'm trying to earn my salvation. And how do we go about talking to someone who makes that argument? If they counter with, yeah, I see your saving faith, but I'll raise you the fact that you're trying to earn salvation. Well, we I looked at the couple of different terms and the definitions for the idea of earn or to earning, the idea of earning or earn. And to merit as compensation or to gain as due reward, to be paid for. It's as if I've worked and I've done this, now you owe me. It's an exchange of services, and as a result, therefore, you need to give me whatever it is that I deserve for this work that I've done. And that's how this term is typically used in relation to viewing works as a means of or as a part of salvation. And another way, a synonym for the idea of earning salvation is to deserve in some form or fashion. So, so consider with me this afternoon, starting in Romans chapter 4 and in verse 1, what Paul says regarding the concept of justification and works. Because this is one of the arguments that you will find people make if they're arguing you can't earn salvation and your Church of Christ's way of doing stuff, that's earning salvation. Some people may come to Romans chapter 4 to make the argument that we are not justified by works but by faith. Starting in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? 
For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And you can see why this particular passage would cause people to think in terms of works, any works, whatever you try to label them, as being trying to earn salvation, and that this is the exact thing that Paul condemns. That has nothing to do with works. That salvation is grace of God only. You, you have faith, and therefore God saves you. But notice the example that Paul is using within the broader context of Romans in describing specifically the aspect in which the Jews served the old law, the mindset and the attitude that they had in serving the law. What shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? That's the question that Paul asks. For if Abraham was justified by works... Consider where Paul's coming from with this. What has Abraham, what has he obtained? What has he found in the flesh of service to the law? If you're only looking at this from the perspective of serving the law, making the sacrifices, doing those things that were commanded under the law, if Abraham was justified by those works, then guess what? His righteousness is his own. He made himself righteous. He earned his righteousness. Verse 3. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Not, and Abraham obeyed the law, never mind faith. Abraham just kind of went through the motions and did the works, and therefore Abraham was accounted for righteousness because of his works. Had nothing to do with God, had nothing to do with belief, and it had nothing to do with, with God's accounting. It would have been Abraham's accounting. Verse 4, this is where Paul applies it. He says, to him who works, to him who is seeking to be justified by works alone, by law, the sense that I'll make myself righteous and I'll make myself godly through these works. The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And if righteousness comes through works, and all I have to do is go through the motions, and it doesn't matter what my faith is, and it doesn't even matter what my attitude or thought process is, if I'm just doing the works, and the works alone make me righteous, then God owes me salvation. I've made myself righteous, and it has nothing to do with him. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And that's where Abraham's example fits into this prospect that the scripture says Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. So it is important to point out that justification and salvation, this is what Paul's point is here in Romans 4, cannot be earned by mere works of law. And it doesn't matter if it's old law or patriarchal law for that matter or the law of Christ. Works of law by itself cannot save because law by itself cannot save. Law condemns. Law points out transgression. Something else has to come in aside from the law to provide for forgiveness. And this is part of what Paul's point is here in Romans chapter 4. That there was a a, a misunderstanding with regard to the obedience of the law and the thought process that somehow just following the motions, just following the commandments makes you righteous. And it doesn't. But we have to also couple that. And if somebody argues from Romans chapter 4, it's okay, I, I agree with you. I completely agree with you that that serving the law by itself, whether it's old law, new law, that can't save you. You're right. Go into the next chapter. Chapter 5, verse 1. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just going back to Abraham. Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Okay. But what did it cause Abraham to do? We would say Abraham, just as in the chapter of faith, the Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham by faith. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now notice how Paul qualifies or he, he, he makes the, clear the understanding that grace is not something that is freely bestowed on anyone and everyone and it doesn't matter who they are or what they are or what they do. Notice Paul, he clarifies, he says that we have access by faith into this favor of God, into this state of being upright before God. And that access by faith. So really what this question is, is not an issue of Romans chapter 4, well, does works uh, somehow not, or, or just going after works, you can't be made holy, therefore there is no law anymore. There's nothing to do. You just have to believe, just have faith. We have to define what faith is. Because if I am to access grace, the only means for me to access grace is through faith. The only way for me to be justified, and that justification is the, the declaration that one is righteous in God's sight. And that's God declaring it. You are justified. I declare you are right in my sight. So if I am justified by faith, and I have access to grace by faith, then how do I define the concept of faith? Is it simply just belief? In Titus chapter 3, and in verse 3, Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3, notice as Paul writes to Titus, and he is describing the need for the brethren to do good, be ready for every good work. Well, why? Why should I be, do good? Why should I be ready for every good work? Why should I uh, be prepared to submit to kings and so forth, as he says in verses 1 and 2? Verse 3, Paul tells Titus, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, and deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. This is the way we were before we came to Christ. This is the way we were before we were saved. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which was poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, isn't it interesting that when you go through this list, the things that are going to pop out for our friends in the religious world, they're going to, things that are going to pop out, kindness, love of God, not works of righteousness, mercy, washing, Holy Spirit, justified by grace. Those are the things that are going to pop out to them. But we have to help direct them. What does Paul say? He says, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared. That was Christ coming in the flesh, offering himself to die, and then raised up and ascended into heaven. That kindness and love of God goes to love the world he gave his only begotten son. That is the kindness and love of God. He came, he lived, he died, and he was raised. That had nothing to do with you and me. And it has nothing to do, carry this even beyond what, what Paul actually says, it has nothing, beyond, nothing to do with what you and I can do even now. I cannot, of my own accord, save myself. I don't have the power to do that. So works of righteousness have nothing to do with making myself righteous. I can't do that. I don't have that power. Again, works of law cannot save. In order to be perfect under the law, I have to keep the law perfectly. Well, no one has, except for Jesus. 
which demands something else outside of works of righteousness. According to his mercy, just as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, that his mercy, coming in with the, the being begotten unto a living hope through his abundant mercy, well, according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. These are two ultimately separate concepts. The washing and then the renewing. And notice the Holy Spirit, verse 6. It says, whom was, so, so the, the New King James, I think the King James, whom he poured out on us abundantly. And I suggest to you that it's not whom, it's which. In fact, the, the, the term there, there, there is no term. It, it's not whom in the Greek. It's just, it's just that which was poured out abundantly. And I suggest to you that it's not the Holy Spirit that's being referenced, verse 6, as being poured out. But rather, notice carrying the analogy that Paul's offering here, the idea of the pouring out, attaches to water with the washing of regeneration. The renewing. This was poured out on us abundantly. Not the water poured out, but the concept of the regeneration and renewing was poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. This was given to us abundantly through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Well, how did the Holy Spirit factor in to this washing of regeneration and a renewing? Well, what did the Holy Spirit direct us to do? Well, first it directed us to believe. Okay, we believe. We've been convicted uh, by the gospel that, I, that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and I need to be saved. Well, then the response to that belief is how that takes place. The renewing of the Holy Spirit and the washing of regeneration. These are two concepts that all go into this, this pouring out of not water, but rather this regenerating. Ultimately, what we know is the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. How that we were washed in that blood. Our spirit, our soul was. To have our sins clean. And so when Paul says, through the washing of regeneration, it's interesting, well, at what point was I washed? At what point was I renewed? At what point then was I justified? Well, what does Paul say? but you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified. In what way have I been washed? What did I do? I believe, okay, that has nothing to do with doing anything. We notice the examples of people who believe but didn't, didn't act on it. So Paul goes on to say, verse 7, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God's grace, love, and mercy are all here in Titus chapter 3. But isn't it interesting that as Paul goes forward, there in Titus, specifically chapter 2 and chapter 3, he's going to reference that the grace of our Lord has appeared. And guess what it teaches us? It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And it teaches us that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. That's what it teaches us to do. So yes, our own works of righteousness cannot earn us salvation. But his mercy begets us again unto a living hope. That living hope being born again, as we noted this morning in our Bible class in John chapter 3, man must be born of water and the Spirit if he is to enter the kingdom of heaven. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, that baptism doth now save you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All of this is connected together. It's connected to the washing of regeneration. It's connected to the renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's connected to both of those being poured out in us. Recognizing that there is a change that takes place. 
going to James chapter 2. And we looked at some of this this morning. And we noted some of the some of the text here in James chapter 2 in connection with recognizing faith without works is dead. But given the fact that we looked at Romans 4, you might challenge your friend or your co-worker if what you say is right in your interpretation of Romans 4, then explain what James means here in James chapter 2. James says in verse 18, someone will say, you have faith, I have works. We don't both have to have faith and works. I'll take care of the works and you take care of the faith. It doesn't really make any difference. To which James says, show me your faith without your works. Can you do that? Now you can talk all day long about how much faith you have, but can you show me your faith without actually doing anything? No. I will show you my faith by my works. I'll prove my faith by the things that I do. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Well, Paul said earlier in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham, verse 2 of chapter 4, was justified if he was justified by works. He has something to boast about. But instead, he makes the case he's justified by faith. Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. So what does James mean? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac? Notice how he defines. He, when he offered Isaac his son on the altar, verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works his faith was made perfect? And notice what else he says. The scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. The point that Paul makes in Romans 4 has everything to do with works for which I am motivated to do to try to earn my own salvation. Two different people doing the same exact works the works of the law, offering the sacrifices, could have two different motivations. One, they could be motivated because they want to obey God. Because of their faith, they are motivated to submit to the law and follow the commandments of God, understanding what they're doing. The other has nothing to do with faith and belief in God, but rather it has the fact that, that this is what God tells me to do, and by doing it, I make myself righteous. Take God out of the righteousness equation. I'll make myself righteous. Look how holy I am. Pharisee on the street corner. Look how much that I have, have tithed, Lord. Thank you that I'm not like these sinners. See, it has nothing to do with the works themselves. The works that are of the law of God, they're the same works. Under the old law, the works were the works. Under the new law, the works are the works. The difference is the motivation, the attitude with which one approaches them. If one approaches them in trying to make myself righteous, God, look how holy and righteous I am because of what I've done. That's the problem that Paul's dealing with in Romans chapter 4. The problem that James is dealing with is the concept that I don't have to do anything. See, and this is where our religious community goes on the flip side. They're so against the idea that I have to obey and do anything. All I have to do is believe that they can't, they can't marry the two thoughts together. They can't harmonize Romans 4 with James 2. When both Paul and James use Abraham as an example, where Paul says Abraham was not justified by works, and James says he was. They're both right. Abraham did not attempt to perform the works, the obedience unto God, in an attempt to make himself righteous or to think himself holy. He did it because he believed in God. He trusted God. Therefore, he submitted to him. And this is the point that James makes. 
Verse 25. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Notice when we go back and understand between the actual text as well as uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we put these together and we understand that Rahab by faith did this. By faith she did it. And yet James says, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? See, the two are integral to each other. In order to prove my faith, faith means nothing if it's only in word. Faith means everything when it's shown in my life in submission and obedience to God. That's what actually, that's why Paul, or, uh, rather, sorry, uh, here in James chapter 2, talking about James, that's why James says that faith, or verse 22, by works, faith was made perfect. It was made complete. Because without the submission to the obedience of what God tells them to do, faith means nothing. You claim to believe in me, you claim to trust me, yet you're not going to do what I tell you to? That wasn't the type of attitude Abraham had. <clears throat> Rahab, she was afraid. The reports she had gotten regarding the God of the Israelites scared her, and she was convinced that that God of the Israelites was greater than all the other gods. And in fact, after the conquering of Jericho, we see Rahab submitting and obeying the old law. She became part of the people of Israel. Rahab played a crucial role in the lineages. She was justified by works because of her faith. In Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 9, Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 9, here's what helps us to understand that any obedience, whether it's the act of baptism or any aspect in which I have to do something to submit to the commandments of God, to obey, this is one of the passages that helps us to show our friends that it has nothing to do with, quote-unquote, earning salvation. Starting in verse 9 of Colossians 2, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When did that happen? Notice when, when Paul makes the case here in Colossians and in verse 11, in him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. The moment I believed the moment I accepted Jesus into my heart? When does that take place? Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. I don't give baptism power. There is nothing within me that can make baptism anything other than being dunked in water. Baptism gains its power by what God did, by raising Jesus from the dead. Baptism has its power because God has bound a promise to that act of baptism. That when you are baptized, your sins are washed away. Of course, that requires understanding. It requires faith. It requires obedience, willingness to submit. Otherwise, you're just getting wet. So when Paul writes to the Colossians, he tells them that they were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. It mirrors Romans chapter 6. In that, as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. And now we're arisen to walk in newness of life, verse 4. Buried with him in baptism, verse 12, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God. God did it. You submitted 
and obeyed, but God did the working. Verse 13, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Here's what happened. Here's what I was before the circumcision made without hands. He, not I, he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. When? When did I go from being dead in trespasses to being forgiven? When did I go from being uncircumcised to being circumcised without hands? Verse 12, buried with him in baptism. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Yes, the specific context is dealing with Old Testament. But to a certain extent, really, all law is a part of what he's describing. The sense that all law without Christ's sacrifice, it doesn't matter what law we're under, it will never save us. Christ had to come in aside from the law. He had to put to, to, to rest, put fulfilled the old law. And yes, it's handwriting the requirements that was contrary to us. And in dying, in, in, in instituting the new law, there was mercy and grace to be had in his blood. Even the new law by itself can't save me alone. It has to be coupled with the blood of Christ, or it's no different. Forgiveness of sins can't be had without Jesus' blood. And the only way I come into contact with that blood is by being baptized. Oh, but that's earning salvation. Paul says it's not. In fact, Paul says over and over again, this is what he did. You were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. He has made you alive together, verse 13. He has forgiven you all trespasses. He has wiped out the handwriting of requirements. He has taken it out of the way because now the blood of Christ is available. We looked at these definitions of earning, idea of earning salvation. And we talked about one synonym for it is to deserve salvation. There is no way that you and I could ever merit of our own accord salvation. There was nothing good in us, and yet God still sent his son to die for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. There is nothing in us by which we can earn salvation. There is no chance for you and I to ever be able to get to judgment and say, God, I have been holy and righteous and I have been perfect. You owe me salvation. In fact, if there were, there would be no need for Jesus. If I could be absolutely perfect and never sin not once, I wouldn't need a savior. But the fact is, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. All need a savior. And that then brings into account the recognition that there's nothing I can do then. Once I've transgressed, I have no power to remove that sin from myself. I can't do that. Only God, through Jesus, through his blood, only can that sin be washed away. That being the case, I can't earn it. I don't merit it of my own accord. I don't deserve it in the sense that God owes it to me. But there is one other definition, a definition specifically of deserve, that I'd like to draw your attention to. This definition means to be worthy of or qualified for because of actions, qualities, or situation. Consider with me Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Colossians 1, and in verse 9, Paul says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. But what difference does it make if all they have to do is believe? They need understanding. Verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, 
being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Notice Paul uses the phrase that you may walk worthy of the Lord. This term, worthy, means recognized as able, matching the requirements. He goes on to say the idea there in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. He's made the way available to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And notice, he says in verse 9, that we want you to be filled. We're praying that you'll be filled with knowledge there in verse 9. Verse 10, that you may walk worthy. Not just believe in a worthy manner. Walk. Always kind of, there's always that association of action, continual action. Fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. What purpose do good works have anything to do if all I have to do is believe? One could argue that Paul saying every good work, well, by doing good works, aren't I earning salvation? No. I'm obeying God. Verse 13. None of this takes away from anything. He has delivered us unto the power, or from, delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of, of His love. That's what He has done. What was the means by which that was done? Through the redemption, or in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's how I could be conveyed into His kingdom. To have my sins washed away to be pure and sanctified. Well, how did that happen? I was baptized. Helping our friends and our neighbors to understand what works is all about. Because there's two main different associations of works in the New Testament. The one that is condemned is works that I do, whether it's of the law or not. And I make it say, see, I am owed salvation. I'm righteous. I'm holy. I've made myself so. I was baptized, therefore I am owed being washed of my sins because I did it. I was dunked in water. No, that's not how it works. But if I submit in faith, I believe and am convinced and convicted of what God has told me through His Son. And as a result, I am persuaded to obey Him when He tells me to believe and be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So I submit, I recognize, I must repent, I recognize, I must confess. So I do those things. Not because I'm making myself holy, but because God told me to. And then I'm baptized. Not because the water has some magic quality, but because God told me to. Well, what does God do when I do that? God washes me clean of my sin through His Son, through His blood. When I arise, God has made me a new creature, not me. And so then from that point forward, when I come to worship God, at the end of the service, I don't say, well, God, I spent an hour at service. Uh, I'm owed some brownie points. That's not how it works. What is it that Jesus refers to regarding the servant and the master, the servant who spent all day working? The master comes in, he wants to eat and drink. Does he say, oh, dear servant, you go ahead and take care of yourself first, then come serve me. No, 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 you come serve me, then you can take care of yourself. And then after the servant does it, does the master say thank you? No. Why? Because the servant has done that which is his duty to do. He's done his job. This is what he's expected to do. In the end, it is that mindset that Abraham had. The mindset of one that serves God because he believes and trusts in him. And it is for that reason his work served to justify him. 
whereas the Pharisee on the street corner, his work served ultimately to condemn him. Not because he wasn't necessarily following the law, but because he failed to understand the spirit of it. That he thought he was making himself holy and righteous. When in fact, nothing, no one can do that of their own power. Only God. That's the lesson for you this afternoon. Considering the believing faith versus saving faith, we understand the differentiation between those two. But then the need to be able to respond when our friends may make the argument, well, if you're talking about a saving faith as doing works, well, that means you're trying to earn salvation. And the way when we go through these scriptures and the context, the way in which these writers write regarding the works of righteousness, context makes it clear that there is no condemnation of obeying God. That is not what's being condemned. It's important that we explain to our friends and neighbors, obeying God has nothing to do with earning salvation. People don't seem to understand that. And ultimately, when it really gets down to it, most people don't want to understand that. Consider for a minute the fact that it's far easier to think of religion as just believe and do what you want and it's okay. Because as long as I don't have this command list that I follow, because that would be earning salvation, it's very convenient. Because it means I don't have to do anything. I can believe God and still feel justified when I don't have to do the good works part. Because if I do that, I'm trying to earn salvation. I can't do that. See, people... They like aspects of salvation. They like the idea of being saved. But actually putting the work into it, actually putting the commitment into it, actually proving it by how one conducts themselves, that's where a lot of people start to say, I'm not really interested in that. I want all, all the parts that appeal to me, but I'll leave the rest. That's not how God's commandments work. If you love him, you'll keep his commandments. If you love him, you won't try to earn your own salvation. You'll believe and submit to the salvation that God offers, the righteousness that is had in Christ Jesus. Yes, through faith and faithful obedience. We offer an invitation this afternoon to those who are not Christians to hear the call of the Lord when he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's not earning salvation. That's submitting to the commandment of the Lord. And when I am baptized, I am washed in regeneration. I am renewed by the Holy Spirit. It brings me into contact with the blood of Jesus. And that is poured out on me so that I can have forgiveness of sins. For those of us who are Christians, in addition to being equipped to try to talk to friends and neighbors who believe in belief only, that's really what it is, and who believe in once saved, always saved, which is kind of a, very, it's a variation of this idea of, of works, uh, uh, of righteousness. You can't do works. Who believe you just don't have to do anything except believe. We're equipped to be able to deal with those thoughts. But also, it serves as a reminder for you and for me that us coming here on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Wednesday night, this doesn't make us righteous. The thought process sometimes that people have, sometimes even Christians, is, well, I've gone on Sunday, I've done what I need to do until next Sunday, I don't really have to think about being a Christian for another seven days. Understand that you and I, being here, we have done that which is our duty to do. God expects us to be here. We're not doing God a favor, as if God owes us one now. Instead, we're doing what God wants us to do. And when we go talk to people and invite them to church, God doesn't owe us one. We're doing our job. When we stand against temptation, we refuse to yield and we stay faithful to God. God doesn't owe us one. Instead, we've done that which is our job. Let's remember 
But as we go out in the world and as we come back together as a congregation, that we not get into a habit of thinking that somehow I'm earning brownie points or some kind of, of cushion. Therefore, I can afford to relax a little bit and not be so, so fiercely against sin or, or temptation. I, I can afford to make one or two slip-ups. It's okay. I went to church Sunday. It's not how it works. If we can help you in any way this afternoon, please come forward as we stand and sing.